Okay, great. So um, welcome to the Amherst Historical Commission public hearing and public meeting on Wednesday, January 12th, 2022. My name is Jane Wald and as chair of the Historical Commission, I'm calling this meeting to order at 6.34 p.m. Pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this meeting is being conducted by remote means. As no in-person attendance is permitted, every effort is being made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. In addition, this meeting is being recorded and minutes are being taken as usual. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so uh, by opening the town's homepage on an internet browser uh, navigate to the town cal calendar at the bottom of that page and click on the Historical Commission meeting link. Zoom and telephone connections uh, and the meeting agenda can be found there. To begin, we'll take uh, attendance of commission members by roll call. So as uh, board members hear your name called, please just answer affirmatively or raise your hand. Um, Patricia Aw. Present. Catherine Davis. Present. Robin Fordham. It's not here at the moment. Becky Lockwood. Present. Uh, Janet Marquart. I'm here. Hetty Startup. Yeah. And Jane Wald, I'm here too. Uh, okay, so um, I'm, I'll just mention that for members of the public, um, opportunity for public comment will be provided during the public hearing and during the general public comment period and at other uh, appropriate times during the meeting. Um, please be aware that commission members will make note of comments but will uh, not necessarily respond to them during public comment periods. Um, again, for members of the public at the appropriate time, please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you've joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes and or at the discretion of the commission chair. Uh, so now we can just move on to the public hearing <clears throat> with this um, preamble. In accordance with the provisions of Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 40A and Article 13 of Town of Amherst uh, bylaws, zoning bylaw, demolition delay, this public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties at interest. The Amherst Historical Commission is holding this public hearing to provide an opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding the following demolition application request. And that is for 47 Olympia Drive, parcel 8D-18, uh, owned by uh, 47 Olympia Drive, LLC. And their request is for complete demolition of a circa 1971 brick building, most recently used as the Chi Omega sorority at the University of Massachusetts. Uh, this application and other historical information on the affected property is available at the uh, document center on the town website. So the public hearing is now open, and if you'll bear with me for a few moments, I'll um, explain uh, goals and procedures for this public hearing. So section 13 of the town zoning bylaw governing demolition delay for structures of historical or architectural significance states that, a that as a matter of public policy, the economic, cultural, and aesthetic standing of the town of Amherst can best be maintained and enhanced by due regard for the historical and architectural heritage of the town. By striving to discourage the destruction of such cultural assets, 
the protection, enhancement, perpetuation, and use of structures of historical and architectural significance located within the town of Amherst, uh, that it is a public necessity and that it is required in the interests of the prosperity, civic pride, and general welfare of the people. So under Massachusetts general laws in the town of Amherst's zoning bylaw, the historical commission is responsible for enacting the purposes and procedures of this policy. So during this hearing, um, we'll follow the, it will, we'll use this following procedure. Um, first, we'll take comments from the applicant uh, if they wish to um, add to uh, information provided in the permit application and supporting materials. Um, then we'll ask town staff for any additional information that may have come to light since um, providing uh, the supporting information. Then we'll take questions from commission members. The applicant uh, will be asked to respond to questions and then there will be a time uh, for public comment. Um, we'll take final comments and questions from commission members and from town staff. And then when the public hearing is closed, we'll begin deliberation without further comment from the public or the applicant unless commissioners ask for specific information. Uh, and later, as we get to that point in the proceedings, um, I'll explain uh, that the commission's deliberations may result, usually result in one of three outcomes, but I will save that for, uh, for a little bit later on. Uh, so, um, so we have information about um, 47 Olympia Drive and if the applicant is here and wishes to um, offer any uh, comments on the application or any additional information, we'll welcome, uh, welcome those comments. Good evening. Sorry, just getting plugged in here. Okay. Hi, Kyle. Hi. Hi. How is everybody? Good. Good. Um, so presenting tonight for 47 Olympia, which is uh, the former Chi Omega sorority next to our 57 Olympia place property. Um, we purchased it in December and I don't know if I have much to add. We are, I think what we presented is that, you know, it's a part of the former fraternity and sorority park uh, development. It was built in the late 60s, early 70s, in this case, 1971. Um, and it's um, a house that, that used to support uh, 40 uh, sisters of Chi Omega. And um, we looked to demolish it and to redevelop the site similar to um, our 57 Olympia project next door. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you. So commission members, based on your um, review of the application and information, supplementary information, do you have any um, questions for, for the applicant? Um, Catherine, is that, is that, that's a question. <laughs> okay, thank you. I do, I, I mean, I think I understand the, the goal of the project, but I, I read that the building was in poor condition. Is that, is that the case? I wanted, wondered a little bit more about that. Kyle, you're muted. I'm sorry. They replaced the windows recently. Um, they did maintain the property quite well. Um, I think the reality is it's just, uh, it's a bit dated. It's 50 years old. Thank you. Um, Hetty? My, my question would be similar to Catherine's. Um, I think I'm looking a little bit more, Kyle, in your um, demolition application for some specifics about the... Uh, in quotes, poor condition of the property. It was only vacated, you know, in 2020. Um, it was 
well maintained. Um, I'm pretty familiar with that property. And uh, just looking a little bit for some more specifics about what exactly is in poor condition in the building. Um, I, I think it's just, um, perhaps I could have used a different word, but I think it's a, uh, in our, in our minds, it's a, a property that has outlived its useful life. And there's another, um, a redevelopment opportunity that will bring more housing and, um, more tax revenue to the town that is better suited to that site. Um, so I think it's, it's, a reuse of that property at that at this point is going to require some capital investment. So I think that, um, it's probably not poor, but it would require some investment to maintain. And I think it's a better investment to use that property to, uh, to provide the housing that we need. Jan. So Kyle, basically, Archipelago bought it in order to take it down and put up something bigger. How many units is, are going to replace this building? What's the goal here? Uh, I think it'll be very similar to Olympia Place next door. I mean, all of the sites when they were originally platted, there's 12 of them, are essentially identical in size of an acre. Um, so I think that the, I think it's a wonderful location uh, to provide, to build some housing that we, uh, that we need here. So I think it would be almost identical to Olympia. It'll look different, but from a but, capacity okay. standpoint, it'll be the same. So 40 young women live there. How many people will be able to live in the new thing on the same space? There are 230 people in the building next door. It'll be the same size. It'll be very, very close. And how many stories are there? Uh, I think it'll be a very similar to next door, which is five stories. I don't know Olympia Place, so I'm oh, sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> so you said four stories. Olympia's five. Five. Okay. So similar to the downtown buildings in height. Uh, yes. Okay. Um, are there any other questions for the applicant? All right. Um, and I'm sorry, Ben, I didn't recognize you earlier if you had oh, yeah. other comments. Uh, no, thanks, Jane. I, um, I guess what I can contribute is, um, you know, having done some historical research on the property, um, there's obviously it's not, you know, it's not listed in any inventory or, you know, repository as a historic site by the state or by the town. It's not, hasn't been recognized in that way. Um, it's, you know, exactly 50 years old. So it's just meets the standards of our bylaw, Article 13, which is, uh, you know, a building 50 years or older shall undergo this type of review. Um, the, I looked a little bit at the history of the Chi Omega sorority. They, they first developed, um, I think, in the early 1900s at a house on Lincoln Ave. And in the 70s, they moved to this site on Olympia Place. And then they've actually since relocated to the original house on Lincoln Avenue, where they first uh, started. And um, they on their website, they're talking about how there's a kind of a national trend to kind of downsizing some fraternities and sororities to a smaller scale. So I think that that allowed them to meet that objective and to kind of harken back to their history and their roots in a way. Um, so, like I said, I mean the uh, this whole er sorry this whole area was developed on Olympia Place as a fraternity and sorority park and was never truly realized in that way. There were a few sites developed but as of now you know the infrastructure is there for read for development um, and numerous parcels exist so i think i think that's about it for what i can contribute okay thank you um and jane if i i have a little more history on that just uh in 1920 they built kyle Omega built the building in Lincoln Ave, 315 Lincoln Ave. And then they had a fire in the late 60s. 
at a time when there was some expansion and at a time when they were trying to get people to sign up for the fraternity sorority park up on Olympia Drive. And so because they had the fire and they were having to invest in their house anyway, they decided to build. Um, so they moved up there. That house supports 40. Uh, they haven't had 40 in a while. Um, with COVID, they definitely weren't going to have 40. And there was a move to get smaller, uh, to do more uh, out of the house. And to uh, and their old house, house actually was, was for sale at the exact moment. So, Okay. That's really quite a coincidence. Thank you. Um, all right, then um, we will, let's at, at this time just to, um, open the floor to public comment. And if there is anyone who would like to um, make a comment on this uh, application for a demolition permit, uh, please use the raise hand function or if you're on the phone, star nine. And seeing no request for comment, um, are there any other uh, comments or questions from members of the Historical Commission or from, uh, or from Ben? Not to Kyle, um, only with, in our discussion, I'll have some. Do you want me to move to close the public meeting? Exactly, yes. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> I move we close the public meeting. I would actually, um, if I would, I would, uh, we got into this issue last time with the local historic district that keeping, I think, I think we're moving, wanting to move towards keeping the public hearing open until a vote is actually passed because we got into an issue last time with the local historic district where they uh, closed the public hearing and then subsequently required more information and so it's going to cause some issues with um how the public hearing was advertised and all that so i think we can maybe close the question and answer period and move towards deliberation but technically i think the public hearing is still i open. withdraw my motion okay <laughs> okay there's a uh, uh agreed uh then, um, then we can move on to um, the standards for designation as a significant structure. And so for those, um, so we will, we'll discuss these standards. They, uh, they're basically four, they're uh, stated in four groupings in the town uh, demolition bylaw. So the first is whether the property is listed on or is within an area listed on the National Register of Historic Places or is the subject of a pending application for listing on said register. And then there are, are a set of criteria related to historical importance, another set of criteria related to architectural importance, and then finally um, criteria that address uh, its the significance of the structure in its geographic context. So, um, Ben, can you put this up on the screen? Yes. That would be great for everybody else. So, when, as the uh, members of the commission uh, move through a discussion of these criteria uh, at the end, the, the result of the deliberation is going to most likely be one of three outcomes. One is a finding that the building is not a significant structure according to bylaw criteria, in which case the demolition permit is approved. A second is a finding that the building is a significant structure according to the bylaw criteria, but that the proposed demolition would not be detrimental to the historical or architectural heritage or resources of the town. In that case, the demolition permit is also approved. The third is a finding that the building is a significant structure according to bylaw criteria and that the proposed demolition would be detrimental to the historical or architectural heritage or resources of the town. 
in that case, uh, the commission has the option to um, not grant the demolition permit for a period of up to 12 months while other um, solutions to the preservation of that historic structure are explored with, with the owner. Um, but we will now, we'll just now go into the criteria. The first has to do with um, whether it is um, on the national register or is the subject of a pending application for listing on the national register. And Ben, I think you've already told us that it, that is not the case that does not apply to this structure. So um, then, um, there is the cluster of criteria related to historic importance. And I'm just going to run through these quickly. And if any um, commission member thinks that um, they would like to, to make a case for uh, these criteria, any, any one of these criteria applying to the structure, please, um, please sing out when I get to the end. So these criteria are that um, the structure has character, interest, or value as part of the development, heritage, or cultural characteristics of the town, commonwealth, or nation, uh, or that it is the site of an historic event, or that it is identified with a person or group of persons who had some influence on society, or that it exemplifies the cultural, political, economic, social, or historic heritage of the community. So um, let me ask uh, commission members if, if anyone has, uh, would like to um, address any one of these criteria regarding historic importance. Well, I think that it probably comes under architectural importance, but I think we need to talk about whether there is, if there are other examples of this style of architecture for um, sort of multi-unit housing and um, whether there's, whether there is a style that went with this sort of uh, Greek enclave there in that part of campus or other parts, if that was sort of, I don't know anything about this, but was, was there a surge of these houses being built in the late 60s and early 70s that are representative of, you know, Greek housing for universities at that time that would stand as part of, I don't know, Amherst history, cultural history, architectural history, or, or anything? I, I don't know anything about this. I'm hoping Ben or um, maybe Hetty can answer that. Um, Hetty. Um, as far as I know, there are, there are all sorts of ways to skin an onion here with Greek housing. And while the model in other parts of the country is to conform with some kind of neoclassical building, clearly that is not the case with Chi Omega. I did reach out to the last um, house director um, before they sold the building. Um, to see if she knew who the architect was, because I'd really like to know, because I think um, the building is interesting, <laughs> you know, in terms of its much more contemporary, um, woodsy kind of field, um, not to use any kind of <laughs> really highfalutin architectural language, but it's, it's, it's a very nice example of a sort of... Um, late modernist contemporary style multi-unit building. I think it was actually intended for more than 40 people. Um, and uh, it's, it's in good shape. You know, I, I think that's the other thing that, that is slightly concerning me um, about the, um, the permit. Um, so I, I could say a lot more, um, but I think um, for our purposes, you know, it's, it's an, it's an interesting take on the idea of housing a lot of people in a, in a culturally interesting and appropriate way for its time. Um, there are obviously other Chi Omega chapter houses around the country 
as far as I know, there aren't any others in Massachusetts. Um, you know, whether it has a kind of unique quality architecturally is, is probably something that would need further investigation um, to find out who the architect of the building was, what other kinds of work they had done. Um, but, you know, clearly it represents a, a, a commitment on behalf of the university to create a Greek life community, um, which is interesting, um, even though it didn't come to pass. Um, so I think, I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. But if it's not unique, could it be typical? You know, the opposite, could it be, are there other buildings like it that were built at UMass for Greek houses? I don't know the answer to that, Jan. Ben, do you know? There's one on either side. Okay. Yeah, there, there were a few developed in that enclave, if you will. Um, and then I think along North Pleasant Street, I don't know if between the university and downtown, I don't know if those structures are were repurposed for fraternities or whether they were built for that purpose, but um, they seem to be large, large multifamily structures. Yeah. And this style is what's appearing on either side, same type of contemporary brick look. I haven't been up there. We we tore one down to build Olympia Place. Okay. And and the other one's currently mostly underutilized from UMass. It used to be their admissions building. Oh, okay. But it was originally planned to be another Greek house at the time. It was built as a Greek house. Um, mm -hmm. And then when it was sold, I believe the university or the Commonwealth took ownership of it. I don't know if it was a sale or, or what, but then it became the admissions building for many years. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to, I, I'm thinking that the discussion so far has perhaps less to do with historical importance than it does to, with architectural importance. Perhaps, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so then I'm going to move on to architectural importance and the criteria um, under that heading is that the structure portrays the environment of a group of people in an era of history characterized by a distinctive architectural style, or that it embodies those distinguishing characteristics of an architectural type, or that it is the work of an architect, master builder, or craftsman whose individual work has influenced the development of the town, or that it contains elements of architectural design detail, materials, or craftsmanship, which represents a significant innovation. Um, so let's see, would you, um, Jan or Hetty or anyone else, would you like to address those criteria? Uh, alternately, I could ask Kyle or perhaps Ben, if you know, if you know the architect or any context for the architect's work, I do not know that information. I doubt it's going to come down to the architect. It seems to me that it's more in the first one. Um, I'm just that's why I was asking about other structures that were similar and whether you know, this period at UMass and certainly other places in the country, this was a, a classic kind of version of a, a new style for sororities and fraternities. I realized neoclassical was popular, but I think it was waning by this time. I saw them where I taught in, you know, places nearby in the Midwest. Um, so, I mean, that's the only thing I'm wondering is whether this was, um, you know, a distinctive architectural style for that era 
for a Greek houses. And I realized there was one that you've already taken down, Kyle, but it's probably because you did it before it came under the 50 year board. So you just, you, you were unlucky that you bought this right when it hit the number of years that it goes under our review. Um, but- Well, uh, well and I, I also think it's just a different understanding of what we think is, I mean, I, I, I guess I'm a little surprised that we're talking about a 1971 you know, fraternity sorority park that some people have never seen before as being something significant. Um, so it is, those are the pictures that we I took every, you know, image around the building. Um, um, it's a, you know, it's a building with, with a number of bedrooms and two wings and a center hall for events. That's it. It's a, built in 1971 and with some new windows in it that went in you know, a couple of years ago. Uh, and that's the building next door that was UMass admissions for many years. So um, both cement block, both built in the early seventies, both with um, vermiculite um, insulation in the walls and asbestos and things all over the building um, because that's what people were building with in the early seventies. Mm -hmm. um, so um, those are the, that's the building we're talking about right there. Yeah. I understand, I've seen these, yeah. I, I think it's distinctive for an era. I agree, okay. with you, Dan. Yeah. I agree with you. And I think we run the risk of, we don't want to evaluate this building in terms of what we think should be happening now. That's not our job as commissioners. Um, even if we might have views about housing in Amherst or um, the fact that this didn't, come to fruition as the fraternity and sorority park that was planned for it. Um, I think it's um, still on its own merits, an interesting building. Um, and, you know, m my feeling is that it does portray something to do with, with that first category in, in architectural importance. It doesn't, it doesn't really sing to me in terms of other um, categories. Um, I think not to jump the gun, but I think the geographic importance is, is also somewhat pertinent um, here. Um, I'm just trying to, you know, we don't really know very much about the architectural um, intent, if you like, of, of this building. I, I, I think that that's something that could be, could be, could be researched. Yeah, okay, I, I, so I'm, go I'm going to um, just restate a couple of things. One is that um, the job of the Historical Commission at this point is not to take into consideration any plans for future development. It is only to consider the historic significance, architectural significance, or geographic importance of this particular structure or the context of this particular structure. Um, I think that we um, we have some of us may have questions about the the architectural style or history or context of this structure, but it appears we we may or may not have answers. So um, so I'm going to ask for um, a, a roll call vote of historical commission members, specifically on the criteria under architectural significance, and then we can move on to uh, architectural importance, then we can move on to um, geographic importance. So, um, and, and maybe just one other um, kind of aside is that um, the Historical Commission, um, you know, its, its role is to think about history and historical significance as um, kind of as it develops. Uh, so we don't concern ourselves only with things that are 200 years old. Um, you know, we want to make sure that we take into account the development of our community uh, and what makes it, what kind of distinctive cultural markers there are within the community. So that's one reason that we are um, that we're talking about a 1971 building. So, um, so perhaps let's now um, just take a, a roll call uh, vote on 
architectural importance. So I will- We didn't do historical, you know, right? We didn't vote on historical. We had no, uh, there were no, there were no comments about historical. We, oh. Well, I started with, with it talking about it there in terms of cultural and social part of the community, but- Okay, then we'll, we'll we start with the architecture. All right, then, then, okay, so then we'll go back through them. Let's have a discussion then first of geographic importance, and then we'll go back to historical, architectural, and then geographic. Okay, so, so we cover all the bases. Um, okay, so geographic importance, um, relates to, uh, there are two criteria, whether the site is part of or related to a square, a park, or other distinctive area, or whether the, the structure as to its unique location or its physical characteristics represents an established and familiar visual feature of the neighborhood, a village center, or the community as a whole. Um, so um, open to comments about those. Well, I, I think um, the property does um, pertain to 134120 um, as the, the site of a somewhat developed um, park intended for Greek life, the Greek life community of UMass. And at one point there were three buildings and intended, I think, I think the idea was that there would be 12 on uh, Olympia Drive and Mayor Drive. Um, and that didn't happen for a variety of reasons, but that's what I would argue is geographically important about this property. All right, so then um, we'll go, let's, we know that the, the top criterion about National Register listing doesn't apply, so then we'll move on to historical importance, and um, is it agreeable that we take all the criteria together under, under that heading? Mm -hmm. Okay, then, um, okay. So then um, would uh, please signify if you uh, agree that criteria under historical importance pertain to this structure. And we'll begin with um, Patricia Ah. You know, I'm, I'm listening to all of the discussion, Jane, and I think so much of what we're saying has to do with the context of of the idea of developing a Greek park and what the buildings were used for. In my opinion, I'm not sure that, that empirically it satisfies any, any of this criteria. I think it's more the context of, of what was intended and what the, the Olympia Drive represents. And so I'm not quite sure how to vote because I, I don't think it specifically meets any one of these criteria. I think it's, it's, it's the whole of it. Um, so help me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you, <laughs> is, that a, uh, is that an abstention? That's an abstention. Okay. Um, Catherine Davis? I'm going to say no to this one, but yes to others. So I'll say no here. Okay. okay. Um, let's see. Robin is not with us. Um, Becky Lockwood. I will say no. Uh, Janet Marquardt. Oh, man. <clears throat> <laughs> well, I mean, I feel the same way, Pat, but I guess... It's not going to make any difference in the end, but I guess I'd like to say yes, just for the last one, because I want to make sure that we go on record, not only fighting to keep very elaborate buildings that were built with lots of money in very elaborate forms, 
and look to mm -hmm. things of, you know, lower level production. So for instance, we've talked about simple farmhouses and, you know, 1960s um, tract houses and stuff is all being characteristic of an era or of a style or of a cultural and mm. social condition of the town. And so I guess just for that reason, I'd like to say yes to 4103 for this, just for the record. Okay, thank you. Um, um, how do you start up? I'm going to say yes to 4103 as well. And I am going to say no. So that is two yes, three no, one abstention. So that um, that does not that won't affect the the outcome of the uh, permit application. Um, Okay, so historic uh, architectural importance. Um, and we'll uh, start again with Patricia Ah. Oh. Again, I, I, have, I have a dilemma uh, as to it, it, the criteria under architectural importance, to what extent the, the building, if we look at it without the context, um, meets any of this criteria. And um, so I, I guess I should probably abstain again. Then um, Catherine Davis. Uh, I'm gonna say yes here. Okay. Thank you. Um, Becky. Lockwood? I guess I, I, I'm, I'm on the fence here um, because I'm not certain that we know whether the architectural style is di distinctive or not. And I don't know, is that up to us um, to find out and research? And, and if it is, then I, I think we should wait, but if it isn't, we don't know, so then I would say no. So I'm sort of in the middle two here. So I guess my I guess my question is: Is it up to us to find out about the architectural importance? Ben, I wonder if you could advise us on this. Um. So, I mean, uh, yeah, I guess you all need to make a decision as to one, whether the building is significant and two, whether it's, you know, should rise as the occasion of placing a, a, a demo, a, a delay on the demolition. So obviously you need information to make those decisions. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, and I think it, it I don't know if there's a, a, a research paper we can find that talks about the you know, distinct styles of Greek houses, that would be really helpful to kind of put this yeah, in context. But um, outside, of, outside of that, I don't know kind of how that, um, how it would be determined if, there, if this is, how distinctive this is. It doesn't have to be about just Greek houses. It's an architectural type from that era. It's a very That's distinct yeah. architectural type. It doesn't have to be, you know, characterized by some sort of, Use um, yeah. innovative um, architectural features that some architects, you know, were known for or anything like that. It is a very typical, and that's what architectural type is, structure of the era. Even its cheap materials are part of that, <laughs> right? and, you know, so. Mm. Um, okay. Um, I don't know how many other examples of it we have in town? That's, you know. Okay. So to kind of move our process along, Becky, how oh. would how what how would I characterize your um... I think I'm gonna have to abstain on this one. All right, then um 
Jan? Yes. Okay. And Hetty? I'm going to abstain. <laughs> oh, gee. <laughs> You should start voting first, so you don't have to break every time. <laughs> um, all right, so this is perhaps out of order, but uh, what if we, um, what if we give us one month to uh, find any qualifying information. We had a month. He sent us this a month ago. Well, we did. Apparently, we did not find the uh, answers to questions we're asking tonight. So, and you uh, realize, however we vote, it doesn't necessarily mean that they automatically get a delay. Well, that's true. That's true. I mean, I'm going to I'm going to vote no because um, we. because these questions that we have had for the last month, if we've had them for the last month, we, yeah. um, we haven't, you know, we haven't necessarily done the diligence we should have to, um, to find the answers. So that's my, um, that's how I'm gonna come out here, except now that now, guess who, guess what the, <laughs> the top vote is here it's abstentions so uh <laughs> so let's move on to let's move on and then we'll go to the end and figure out you know whether this is significant and whether what what we want to do in the end ben All right, i don't know where my raised hand is so um i was going to add another option is to continue the public hearing um mm -hmm. for, till a date certain and then that's a that's in order, and you would need to specify very specific information that you would need in order to make your decision um, at the next right hearing date. Um, and that's another reason why the, we kept the public hearing open um, okay. just now. So um, that that is another option outside of, you know, in order to help aid your decision. Because I think, you know, and I think we didn't necessarily know exactly what questions would arise at this right. hearing. So it was hard. Well, to I asked you process. questions right away by email and you answered them. So we all saw some of that, you know, that's right. a way to do it. Well, so, yeah. I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of looking okay. at stuff when it first comes out. So. Okay. So um, let's go to geographic importance and then we can sort of wrap is up in any any variety of outcomes. So um, votes for geographic importance. Um, uh, Patricia All. The intent of it has geographic importance for for a Greek uh, park. And so I would I would say yes. Uh, let's see, Catherine. I'm sorry, muted. I'm so sorry. I was saying, I would say yes, it's, it's, I'm on the line for this, but I think that there is something that can be argued for the fact for 1341.20, as in, we're looking at the context or part of the intent. Um, Becky? Uh, I'll say no. Okay. Uh, Jan? Uh, I have to say no on this one. I don't think it's that distinctive, the area. And Hetty? I'm going to say yes under 4120. Okay. And um, I'm going to say yes also. Um, so that's a yes. So we have, so the operative uh, sets of, the, just the definite uh, uh, operative set of criteria has to do with geographic importance and we're 
a little bit on the fence with um, architectural importance. Um, so let's see. Um, at this point, we need to determine whether um, we believe this has well, the criteria, our vote on the criteria establishes that we think it has um, uh, significance as a structure. Um, and now our, now we need a motion about whether to grant the um, demolition permit and a second to that motion. And then we can have further discussion about uh, what to do about this. So uh, a motion. Or do we want before we make the motion, do we consider whether those who abstained need more time to do research? Or is it the vote taken and that's that? I think we need to go ahead with a motion because okay. we have gone through the criteria and on um, at least one of them, which is all that is needed. Okay. We have established right. there is significance. Okay. So then what, you know, how we proceed um, is the discussion that comes after the motion. Okay. You wait for me to make the motion, everyone. <laughs> yeah. uh, let's, let's change things up. Yeah, let let's, somebody else do it. Come on, Catherine, make the motion. Um, I, I make the motion to I move. move and I and move, but <laughs> I don't know. I haven't done this before, Dan. Help me. <laughs> well, I, I was just gonna add, Jane. I mean, I think there is opportunity for discussion if there if folks are there, thinking there otherwise. is. And, <laughs> yeah. Yes, that that comes after the motion. After the motion. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right, go ahead, Jan. Okay. I move that we um, grant Archipelago the demolition permit for, what is the address? 47 Olympia Drive. 47 Olympia Drive. Okay, so that uh, okay. that signifies that, that the commission has found that this is a significant structure, but that its demolition would not impair the historic or architectural uh, uh, so that's part of the discussion. We have to make a m motion to to consider this by moving to look at it, right? This is this is what I don't know. When I was just a second ago, are we going right. to do more research? Are we going to wait another month? I that's I mean, that's the discussion we're having right now. At, because <laughs> the motion has been made and has been seconded by someone, has it been seconded? No, so I second it. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay. thank but you. That was the appropriate motion. Now, it was the appropriate motion. Thank you. So okay. now, now we discuss what what to do about this. Get Catherine a drink. It's been a long day. Okay. This is like my right. sister so, meeting. So here are our options. We can proceed to an immediate vote to grant the demolition permit. We can. Um, vote against the demolition permit. We can place conditions on the demolition permit, which could involve, or we could simply vote. Okay, Ben, spell, spot me here. Uh, we could vote down the motion and then vote to continue the hearing. Um, yeah, correct, yeah. Or it would be a continuation of the discussion of the motion. Yeah. That's yeah, I, I, think I, I, think, I, think, I think either way works. Yeah. Okay. So if I could just, I can um, maybe start off the conversation. I, I, I'm sensing obviously there's sensitivity towards the um, distinctiveness of this building and the, you know, it's. Uh, kind of connection to the this part of Amherst history and 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 all of that um you know I think regardless of what you decide a, a good option is also to or a good condition might be to uh inventory the property at the very least because right now um it's not listed on the state 
register. There, there's no um, inventory form. So when the building is demolished, that history uh, would be lost. And similarly, if there's any pictures of the previous building at 57 Olympia Drive, we might do that at the same time as well. So that's a way of at least, you know, preserving in a sense the, the history um, and, you know, might be something you consider uh, outside of, you know, in addition to the, what you decide on the demolition as well. I'm really glad you said that, Ben, because that was something I was going to bring up if we could do, if we could start that process. Um, because yeah. to me, regardless of what we decide in the next few minutes, I really think that this should be documented. Okay. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And, and my comments and abstentions were about the context of the building and that should, that should be documented. So if it's inventory, mm -hmm. it will be documented. So can we do a delay until that happens and perhaps the Let's developer can give us more information about the architect? Well, that's not the developer's purview to have to tell us the history or the architect that was that built this building. Um, and, and if it's going to be documented, yeah, we could just ask for enough time to have that happen before demolition. What I'm wondering is, uh, Kyle, you're going to die when you hear this, and you're going to probably, if you ever meet me on the street, you're going to push me into an oncoming car, but um, would Archipelago consider incorporating a portion of this building into the new one to keep that look on a, a section of it to kind of pay homage to that style and that effort that was made at the time? I mean, I'm sure you probably have the plans, you're ready to go, you, you know, you're starting to put the piling mm -hmm. in as we talk, but has that been considered at all? Uh, <clears throat> there are some bricks within the, the building that are important to Chi Omega that we said we would maintain for them, obviously, because they want to remove them and take those before it comes down. Um, we have not thought about integrating something else from the building into what's proposed. It's obviously a building that we think is more suited to our current condition than uh, the building in the past. Um, I will say that um, um, a delay is serious business, um, does cause, does cost real money, does in, you know, jeopardize yeah. projects. Um, does prevent things from moving forward in a time that we really don't need that. And I just needed to make sure everybody was aware of, of things like that. I have no problem documenting the building, um, um, but uh, a delay is, does have real world uh, repercussions. So the plans are, are finished and ready to roll. There's no modification to the style that's possible. I think, I think you might find, I think, I think, you know, some of the elements of, uh, I mean, there's, we haven't talked about taking any of the bricks off the building or any of the window trim or saving any roof uh, overhangs or there's mm -hmm. not much to the building. I mean, it's a gable roof on a, on a brick box with some bump outs for the units. Mm -hmm. um, so we haven't talked about saving any of that in any meaningful way. Um, because I don't, it's not, there's not, it's not a building where that's something like that is readily apparent to save. You're not saving a keystone or a. No, uh, I would be talking about, you know, a portion of the, <laughs> the bump outs on the gable simple box. I mean, that's the look of that era. But so I th saving I think a portion, option, saving a I portion think an of option the for us, I think an option for us is to um, go ahead and take a vote on the demolition application, I mean, we could take a positive vote on it with a condition that um, documentation occurs in a, in a timely fashion and is submitted to the historical commission or town staff. So what is it? I'm sorry. Uh -huh. It, yeah, it sounds like that's the motion, Jane. That's not the motion. That's part of the discussion. But but it but it's 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 asking for a motion to to that effect. 
it's yeah. so the, the motion is to allow the demolition permit to go forward period we still have the option of placing conditions on that so it's just a suggestion for a condition yeah right and what is documentation if i may ask what does that entail then yeah, so the, uh, the state um, Massachusetts Historical Commission has an inventory form. It's called the, their Form B, and it's fairly straightforward. It's, uh, you know, images of the, of the building, you know, and architectural description, historical description, a, a bit of narrative. Okay, I can find and, it. Okay, yeah, and I was going to say, you. too, we, we do have a CPA monies and due diligence funds if we needed to, like, bring in someone from the outside to do it, but uh, usually we can handle them in-house as well. Okay. Okay. Um, are we ready to come to a vote? So I think someone needs to make a motion maybe about yeah. that condition. If we need uh, to amend, right. right, we need to amend the uh, motion. Friendly amendment. All right. I, I could do it. I, I'd be happy to do that. Or you say, yes. correct me if I, I have the, the, the terminology wrong. I vote that we move to approve the demolition with a condition that documentation be made, um, the historic documentation in a timely fashion. Is that, is that right? Well, that a, uh, an inventory be made. An inventory. To, according in to the, the procedure that the state outlined. Yeah. And okay. Will the historic commission be responsible for that part? No. Uh, oh, you mean our historic, the local historical commission? Yes. 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 To 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 do the inventory. Okay. Ben. It um. I. You know. Frankly, I've never in my two or so years here, I've never done an inventory form. I. I assume we send it to the state historic commission and maybe they look for comments from the local, from the Amherst historical commission, but, um, you know, certainly members of the commission can do research and help out in, in, <laughs> in, in producing the document, but I don't know if, uh, if it's really the commission as a whole that, uh, guides the process per se. Okay, so sense. I think, yeah, yeah I, I, I think that we will have some responsibility for the completeness and the submission of the form. And um, if we decide to do this, then we should add that the demolition can only commence after we're satisfied with the inventory, that it's complete. Right. And I, and I, I would just say that that, that is, um, uh, my only caution is that we're talking about a 1971 building that many people have not seen, that is tucked away, uh, that is, um, and I and uh, I wouldn't want to get caught into an inventory process that is long and continuous and takes multiple meetings and costs consultants fees and CPA money for a project that many people have never seen before. Uh, so I just want to be cautious of 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 that, please. I don't think it's a lengthy process, is it, Ben? Okay, I just don't know. I just I don't know. And I'm here. Um, I, I, I don't think that there is a um, specific timetable. I, if, if what we're talking about is that the form is accepted by the State Historical Commission and listed on the database, that's something out of our control. And I think it would not be reasonable for us to to, yeah. to, to, hit, to hinge the, the... No, I wasn't suggesting that. Just okay. that it's complete I, and ready to send. And we feel I, like we've got documentation. I, I think I think that the thing that we need to say is that the Form B has been completed and filed with the state. Yes. And because that, we can do that in a timely fashion. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. And Ben can be the arbiter and say it's good or it's not good. You didn't complete yeah, it. it doesn't require a meeting. It just a matter of sitting down and doing it and maybe getting photos from you of the inside and more of the yeah. outside something. So, yeah. Okay. 
All right, so we have a motion, we have an amendment. Um, can someone, someone needs to someone second, Becky. second the amendment? So, uh, I will second the amendment. Okay, thank you. All right, um, then let's go to a vote. And um, is everyone clear on the motion and the amendment? It is to allow the demolition permit to go forward. Um, on the condition that uh, a an state historical commission inventory form B is completed for the property in a timely fashion. Completed and filed. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, but we're not hinging it on. Um, we're not hinging it on approval by the state. We're just hinging it on the process of doing the form B. Right. And getting so, that, getting um, that to the state. Jane said completed. She didn't say filed. Filed would depend on the state accepting it. Completed is that it's ready to send off. Okay. Right. Okay. All right. Then um, okay. let's go to a vote. Patricia Aw. Uh, I agree. Uh, let's see. Catherine Davis. Yes, I agree. Becky Lockwood. Yes. I agree. Thank you. Janet Marquardt. You know, Kyle, I never said that I didn't want the building to be demolished. I just wanted to make sure that we had a record that this is something that has architectural significance. So I agree. <laughs> the motion. Right. I'm just giving you a hard time, Kyle, because I don't want your life to be too easy. <laughs> and Hetty, start up. Um, I'm going to abstain. Um, I don't work for Chi Omega, but I do work for a UMass um, a sorority, and I think in the interests of trying to be fair and impartial, I, I'm going to abstain. All right. And I vote yes. So we have, let's see, five yes and one abstention, so the motion passes, and we, uh, we How about work we've done this. Uh, all right. Thank you, and I'll talk. I'll reach out to Ben. I appreciate it. Okay, thank you, Kyle. All right. Have a good night. Okay. Bye -bye. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Uh, so at this time, I'd like to um, ask for a motion to close the public hearing. I'll make that motion again. Let's close. The public. <laughs> thank you, Jan. And may I have a second? I'll second. Thank you. And all in favor, raise your hand. Aye. Thank you. Unanimous. Great. Thank you. Okay, so the public hearing is closed and now there is a tech wet, a joint meeting that we will open with um, the, the trustees of the Jones Library. Correct, so thank you to the library trustees for your patience and Sharon and uh, for the members of the public <laughs> as well for bearing with us. Have you not learned a lot? <laughs> about what, but have you not learned a lot? <laughs> okay, well, um, welcome. Um, uh, it's a real pleasure to uh, be able to uh, participate in this in this meeting with all of you um, from the library. Um, we. Um, in a way, we should do more of this, but we have a specific uh, purpose for, for this this evening, and that is to um, hear about the historic structure report for the Jones Library. And um, uh, I just maybe have just a couple of things to, to, to say about the project, uh, because I am one of the guilty ones who thought that this would be a terrific idea to have a historic structure report for the job <laughs> uh, that could, um, that would be a kind of a marker for um, how uh, we as a community could talk about the, the historic significance of um, elements of the library and its importance to the community through time uh, and the future direction for the library. But, you know, from our perspective as a historical commission, um, wanting to document and honor uh, and um, preserve important sort of 
significant elements of this um, very important community structure. Uh, but also to uh, provide um, kind of an objective uh, benchmark for being able to prioritize the uh, significance of historic features um, of the building. Uh, as you know, we as a community contemplate um, change. Um, so that was kind of the original impetus for the historic structure report. And um, it has of course run into a couple of speed bumps. Um, and I'm just really um, delighted that uh, the current team led by Ann Marshall and Eric Gradoya um, has produced uh, such uh, a compelling report, uh, clear in um, its assessment of the building. And um, I think it uh, has given all of us, and uh, I hope especially the trustees, um, a, a helpful tool uh, in, in forward planning. So um, I'm uh, delighted that, that this project has uh, come come to this moment and am oh. really eager uh, to hear more from the Historic Structure Report team. Austin, please. First of all, Jane, thank you. Thanks to the commission. Thanks to Ben. And obviously, thanks for the wonderful work that went into the Historic Structures Report. I think I have to do a formality, Jane, since there is a quorum of the library trustees here, I think, and the meeting has been noticed. I think I have to call us to order and take attendance. Is, do I, is that okay to do? Please, yes, please do. Good. Okay, so I wanna call the meeting of the Jones Library Board of Trustees to order and would ask you to signify your presence by saying um, that you're here. Alex? Here. Thank you. Tammy? Yes. Farah? Here. Nice to see you. Uh, Bob? Here. And I see Lee Edwards lurking in yes. the shadows. There you go. Yeah. And, <laughs> and I'm Austin Sarrett. So we're all, we're all here and all convened. And again, thank you for uh, this opportunity. And thank you uh, really for the great work that went into this historic structures report. Thank you. Thanks, Austin. Welcome. Welcome all. Um, so at this point, I believe, um, Ben, will we uh, promote Anne and Eric and Carly? Yeah. Good evening. Hello, Anne. Hello, Eric. Hello. Hello, Eric. <laughs> and hopefully we have, can we bring Carly Regalado on as well? Hopefully Carly's there. Here she yes. is. There. Um, Hi, Carly. We're hey, Carly. Uh, we're looking forward to presenting the Jones Library Historic Structures Report this evening. And I'd like to give you a bit of background on who we are. My name is Ann Marshall and I'm a, on a one-year appointment at visiting lecture in architecture at UMass Amherst. I was asked to take over the reins as the principal investigator on preparing the Jones Library HSR mm -hmm. from, from Professor Elder Walker at UMass. And I brought both Eric Gradoya and Carly Regalado onto my team to complete the work. Pulling these two onto my team has been my biggest and wisest contribution to this project, as I think you'll see from Eric's presentation this evening. Um, Eric Gradoya consults in the field of architectural history and building conservation. He's the director of historic preservation at Historic Deerfield and previously held positions at the Albany, New York firm of Messick, Cohen, Wilson, Baker Architects and with the Massachusetts Historical Commission. He served as an adjunct faculty member at Roger Williams University 
in the Boston Architectural College, teaching undergraduate and graduate courses in American architectural history. He holds his BA in architectural conservation from Roger Williams University and his master's in historic preservation from the University of Vermont. Eric's primary fields of study include New England vernacular architecture and the evolution of American building practices. Carly, uh, the other member of my team, has a degree in political science pre-law from Michigan State University and is currently pursuing a master's degree at UMass in Historic Preservation and Architecture. She plans to graduate this spring and is currently working on her thesis titled Mycelium, The Building Blocks of Nature and the Nature of Architecture. I hold a degree in Interior Design from Auburn University and a Master's in Architecture from Harvard. I've held uh, various adjunct positions at UMass, Mount Holyoke College and Hampshire College prior to my appointment at UMass. And my first project out of school was to carry out a, a winning competition entry for the Women's Rights National Historical Park in Seneca Falls, New York, for which I was on the other end of an HSR done by the National Park Service, formulating a design which met all the established design parameters while preserving the critical historic fabric. I currently have my own architectural practice in Amherst and also partner with my husband in our interpretive ex exhibition design company. Uh, we'd like to thank Professor Elder Walker and her students for getting the ball rolling on this report. Town Meeting, which allocated the funds in 2017. Uh, Benjamin Brager in the Amherst Planning Department. Jane Wall, uh, Chair of the Historical Commission. The Jones Trustees and the staff of the Jones Library, including Sharon Sherry, Facilities Supervisor George Hicks, and Head of Special Collections, Cynthia Harbison and her staff for all manner of help. I'll turn the presentation over to Eric, uh, after which there will be time for any questions that you may have. And UMass Amherst thanks you for the opportunity to complete this important work for the town. We've had a, it's been an education for us and, and you know, I think we have all gotten uh, different positive aspects out of the project. So we look forward to to giving you the presentation. So all yours, Eric. All right, very good. Well, let me see, I'll start to share my screen. Um, let's see. Oops. There we go. Okay, um, I'd just like to begin by um, sort of giving you a, um, uh, refresh your memory on, on the scope of the work of the project and that um, the scope of the historic structures report or HSR was to pro provide a background on uh, the architects and design of the 1928 building, uh, provide an architectural description, um, an analysis of the building's plans in relation to the original layout and design, um, do an overview of chronology of changes to the building, and then uh, an assessment of the physical condition and offer uh, recommendations for the treatment uh, of the building itself. So I'd, I'd first like to begin with to talking about the, the architectural firm that um, uh, designed this building. And that's uh, the Boston firm of, of Putnam and Cox Architects. You may have heard their name are familiar with it um, uh, from the history of the library. Putnam and Cox started in uh, 1901 and had uh, approximately an, a 40 year run. And uh, their projects are largely understudied and, and there really isn't a full representation of, of their work. They worked primarily in Massachusetts and the surrounding New England states. Uh, in Massachusetts, there are uh, 50 known buildings uh, and structures that, that are attributed to them. Uh, they largely were responsible, responsible for uh, large private dwelling houses, uh, public buildings and institutional buildings as well. What, uh, what's written on them, what does exist, which is very little, um, often notes so that some of their best works are the, the Jones Library and the Lord Jeffrey Inn or the, uh, the, the Inn on Boltwood as it's known now. 
uh, they've been credited with designing and constructing nine fraternity houses for Amherst College and a number of buildings at um, Mount Holyoke College. Most of their residential buildings are found in the suburb, suburbs of Boston, so uh, Brookline, Watertown, uh, Boston proper uh, itself. And they worked largely in the what's known as uh, the colonial revival style, or back in the early 20th century, late 19th century, what was referred to as the new colonial style. And this was a method of, a, um, a design of architecture that took inspiration from early American building examples, buildings you know, from 17th, 18th, and 19th century. And it drew from them stylistically and also from their architectural elements and, and uh, materials that were, were used in those buildings. And sometimes these uh, colonial revival buildings are, um, uh, you know, the, the, the use of, of design and ornament was kind of free and loose. And in other instances, it was a, a very academic and a, um, sort of a very specific uh, copy of representations of past pieces of architecture uh, and, and buildings. Um, so while Putnam and Cox is often attributed to the building, it, this building, the, the library is really the product of Alan Howard Cox, who you see here on the, uh, the right-hand side of the screen. Uh, he, he was the principal who, who was, uh, is attributed through documentation, it's well-documented, for designing this building and seeing its construction. Uh, Cox is a very interesting man. He, you know, he was, um, he's the, the son of a, a physician. He was offered a, a very good education as a child and as a young man. He, he studied in uh, schools in Holyoke and uh, Williston Seminary in Northampton. Uh, from there, he went to MIT where he studied architecture. He continued his studies in Paris at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts. He comes back to America in about 1900, 1901, and um, uh, teams up with uh, William Edward Putnam to, to start his firm, their firm. Uh, he continued as a professor until 1913 at MIT. Um, but what's most fascinating I find about him is that he, he was uh, born in South Hadley. So he's, he's local to the area. And given sort of his background and other pieces of architecture um, that, that uh, are attributed to him and, and, and the firm, uh, I imagine that he had a very strong interest in, in architecture and his surroundings as a young man. Um, I should say he, pa he passed away in Granby, Massachusetts in, in 1944. He lived largely in Cambridge. Um, so when you look at this building, while most people say it's a colonial revival building, uh, that's really not doing it justice because um, it's, that's really a generalization, a very broad term. Uh, when, you, when I look at this building and what I hope to sort of instill in, in, in all of you is when you look at this building, this is a, a colonial re revival structure that is, is heavily inspired and deeply rooted in Connecticut River Valley architecture, specifically uh, 18th century Connecticut River Valley architecture. And what's really impressive about that is that when this building was initially designed in the late 19 teens and constructed in the, in, uh, the 1920s, 1927, um, people weren't really focusing and looking at specifically Connecticut River Valley architecture or vernacular architecture and sort of it, you know, its history and influences. So, so Alan Cox had a very keen eye and was very much aware of his surroundings, I'm sure as a young man. So to really understand this building, what I'd like to do is just give you a little bit of a background on what exactly I mean by Connecticut River Valley vernacular architecture. Um, because, you know, the term, and I use it in quotes, colonial is, you know, is very broad. It could mean a lot of different things. But um, 
and you know, I'll talk about this in the context of the Connecticut River Valley within Massachusetts and, and Connecticut. But um, so it, in the 17th and 18th centuries, unlike the coastal communities of say, you know, Boston, um, uh, Providence, uh, Portsmouth, these, these urban coastal hubs, uh, the towns within the Connecticut River Valley were, were essentially largely isolated and, um, and distant from the influences and the, the, the sort of current fashions that were either going on in, in these urban areas along the coastline or um, the ideas and trends that were being brought over from overseas and, um, uh, and you know, sort of taking place uh, during the, the late uh, 16, early 1700s. So as a result of that, a, a very unique, um, uh, the, the valley towns uh, develop kind of architectural styles, furniture styles that are very unique to this region, this area, uh, especially their detailing. So as you see here on these different pieces of furniture and, and, and architecture, you, you know, you, you see sort of this, you know, carved ornament of, uh, you know, vines and tendrils and flowers. You see things used like, um, you know, ro rosettes up here in the, the capital areas of this frontispiece, um, different sort of floral motifs, um, carved ornament, um, sort of what's known as gouge and punch work that's utilized these heavy pulvinated friezes here. Um, so a, a wide ranging, a, a wide range of different ornament and detailing that is is at this time just very local to um, to the valley region. You don't see this elsewhere. You don't see this in architecture and furniture in sort of the you know uh, in the Boston area down in um, you know you certainly don't see it in in the Hudson River Valley to our neighbors to the west and whatnot. This is very specific here. Um, in addition to this, so um, these, um, uh, so what was going on in the valley during the, uh, the uh, early 18th century, as, as the population hubs, as the urban areas increased in, in their populations and densities, um, the, the products of the agriculture here in this region are, are feeding these different areas and whatnot. And it makes the towns here very prosperous. And by uh, the mid 18th century, the, um, the farming villages along the Connecticut River Valley were some of the uh, wealthiest agricultural communities in all of the colonies. So um, we have these families that, that are generating um, you know, great wealth and um, these, sort of the, the, the wealthiest of these, these elites, um, what were known as the river gods, um, families like the Dickinsons, like the Williams, like the Dwights, um, a way to show off their status in the community and whatnot was uh, the development of, of a new sort of building type, a new, um, I don't wanna say a new form of architecture, but it was largely a, a building type that differentiated itself from um, the building forms, the traditional building forms of the, um, say, the first, uh, you know, almost the first half of the, uh, the 18th century. And what that form was, and we're probably all familiar with this, right, is, is the center chimney house. These, uh, this house type that, that um, comes over from England and uh, spreads throughout, throughout New England where we have generally you know, one large chimney mass that rises up through the center of the building with a door on its axis. You enter into, into a, lar uh, sorry, a, a small tight vestibule with a winder stair to it, rooms to either side. That was the traditional dwelling house form um, for generally for good houses, I should say too. But um, this house form of, of the river gods, which I'll call the large mansion house, of the 18th century is this house plan here. And that's represented by these two, house, uh, two houses I'm showing. And what that is, is around the 1740s, um, uh, the, the emergence of this center passage house, right? So where the chimney, the center chimney is removed 
two separate chimney masses are constructed um, and uh, you have a large open stair hall, well, a large open passage that allows for a, a straight run stair. And that's, that's one of the hallmark features of this, this mansion house is that, that center stair, center passage. The other feature is this gambrel roof form that begins to emerge around 1740s and then onwards. And this, this house form lasts till about the third quarter of the 18th century and then gets replaced with a, a, a new form. Um, but this, this, you know, this gambrel roof, which is a very visual distinct feature, um, separates the, this house from the more common pitched roofs, gable roofs that, that were um, traditional of the time. And then the third architectural detail that, that kind of completes this new house form are these elaborate frontispieces that you see here uh, uh, at the entries. And here are a couple of, exa of examples uh, re removed from their buildings, but still in, in existence. And what these are are Connecticut River Valley doorways. Um, this is a, a, a door type, a door surround, again, like the furniture, like those uh, details I was talking about, that you only see within the Connecticut River Valley area. Um, and uh, they are inspired by classical door surrounds that are, you know, are being illustrated in English and European architectural treaties that were uh, popular, you know, again, in, in urban areas and hubs and all, you know, all throughout the colonies. But what these, um, what sets these apart are a number of different details to them aspects. Um, first off is just their proportioning. Um, they tend to be much wider and taller pieces. And that is to, um, to accommodate the tradition of double doors that most, most of these houses utilized a feature that was unique, really unique to the Connecticut River Valley. Um, the proportions of them are, are off, um, um, but also instead of using true classical ornament like or, or orders, like, you know, ionic Dora columns or whatnot, you see that they utilize things like um, pedestals here with paneling to them. Notice the pedestals of, of this door surround here. Um, you know, these motifs that are coming out of the, you know, the furniture uh, that's being produced and um, that's heavily inspired by agriculture and, the, you know, the, um, the land. So vines, tendrils, um, uh, flower tulip ornaments, uh, rosettes up in these, uh, up in the scrolls. Um, so this completes that, that, that sort of large mansion house. Um, uh, building type. And um, so when we look at Jones Library and we look at it carefully and closely, we see that it's much more than just a, a colonial revival building. It's, it's Alan Cox's take on this Connecticut River Valley architecture and this Connecticut River Valley house. Um, so as you look at the frontispiece here, which is a wonderful now 20th century interpretation of an 18th century architectural element. Um, you see that it, it, you know, it utilizes a lot of those details, the scroll top pediment, you know, the little bracketing, this very interesting ornament here, the pilasters, the tombstone panels at the, uh, the, in the pedestal. But then it's also being adopted for 20th century accommodation. So instead of double doors, it's a single glazed door here, but again, you know, tying in that panel work down below. Uh, it employs side lights into it. You know, it has the the transom lights, you know, up above in the style of kind of the tombstone um, uh, paneling that we see. So um, what Alan Cox is doing is 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 his own interpretation of this. Connecticut River Valley dwelling house imposed on essentially an institutional building. And from the get go, um, and I'm sure some of you are familiar with this, you know, the idea was to design this building after a residence. You know, if you look at uh, other libraries that are being constructed, even in, in the immediate area around here, you know, Arms Library and, um, oh, what are some of the others? Uh, 
uh, I'm forgetting their names, but a lot of the times they're in they're they're in class the classical styles. So this is a a, a really uh, unique sort of departure and a very unique building type and form for for a library. Um, so. I'd like to look carefully at the building now and sort of walk you around it and then through it to give you an understanding of what, how the building appeared and what so, uh, what the character defining features of it are um, and what, what remains. And the building remains, lar you know, lar largely intact when we look at it on the, uh, on the exterior. It's lost, it's, uh, it's lost the shutters at, at the windows. But, um, but when we look at this building, what Jones Library exhibits is a studied understanding of the local historic architecture uh, with design and construction methods characteristic of the early 20th century. Um, if you look at all the materials on the exterior, they draw from the colonial palette. Um, so its form and massing is, is, is reminiscent of that large mansion house um, um, dwelling. Uh, it has that sort of that boxy form to it, the large gambrel roof, um, single story wings that are projecting that project off the main body of the building. Um, and then as we walk around, I'll show you this, you know, sort of um, uh, the other elevations. But um, so to the unfamiliar, it appears as a large residence, um, just as intended uh, by the architect. And this is reinforced by the use of traditional domestic details for many of the exterior architect, architectural elements. So these include, um, like, like I showed you, this you know this this frontis piece here at the uh, south entry, but um, a, you know a slate roofing material, uh, dormers and you know large chimneys, uh, symmetrical sort of composition to the building. Um, a beautiful classical cornice right underneath the roof line here, copper gutters. If you look at the fenestration of, of the building, it's all multi-light wood frame windows, typical of what you, you'd find in a, in a dwelling house. Um, Cox's own unique sort of uh, little treatment are these um, sun porches, as he calls them. Uh, and then as we walk around, you'll see that, um, on the side of the building here, he includes kind of this sprawling wing, this rear L that, that um, projects to the north off, much the way you would see on a vernacular dwelling house that has evolved over time and, and grown. Um, so in a, in a house, we'd expect to see the services, kitchen back here, maybe an attached barn or outbuilding woodshed. Um, so, so, you know, Cox, in order to accommodate the functions within the building, um, includes this, 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 this essentially L, back L to it. But if you notice, he changes up the palette of materials. So instead of all stone that we see on the front facade, um, he utilizes uh, brick, some clapboards, again, large multi-light windows to it. Uh, these tall masonry um, chimneys. Um, it's more regular than, than the front of, of the building. And then, um, and then as we go around to the back of, of the original part of the, the library, um, on the north elevation, it's uh, treated with this central pavilion element with this um, Palladian window here. And and remember that, keep that in your minds. It, it'll come into play as I show you uh, some images down, uh, down the line. Um, so the original plans of the building and, and the original um, ar arrangement on the interior. So um, this, you know, mirroring the domestic appearance uh, of the exterior, the interior itself was designed and constructed in a scale and appearance reminiscent of a, a stately 18th century house. Uh, and this was achieved through the, an arrangement, uh, the arrangement of spaces, the scale of the rooms uh, and their architectural treatment, nearly all of which still exists. Um, 
So the interior was organized into a, a series of, of discrete spaces, uh, each intended for its uh, uh, specific use or uh, activity. Um, so a, a close look at the plans here shows that there's a clear hierarchy of spaces on the interior of the building, both by floor level and as you ascend up um, th through the building, uh, with the most public rooms located on the ground floor and uh, increasingly private spaces as you, as you ascend up through the library. Um, so uh, this is the original ground floor plan. It was really divided into um, the, you know, the children's stacks and reading area, um, the adults reading rooms and, and stacks here and periodicals, um, administrative spaces, special collection space in, in the East Sun Porch. Um, and then this is that rear L that he has projecting off, right? And that was the original uh, auditorium space. So uh, the seating area and then the stage area here. As we move up to the second floor, you'll see here, so we're in the stair hall and really in the main block of the building, um, it was three large spaces, uh, an exhibit room, the Amherst collections room and uh, the Jones Memorial room. Uh, and then in the side wings, um, the much, these much, much smaller rooms, uh, we had uh, a music room, the fine arts room originally. And then again, in that auditorium wing on the L, um, as one ascend, ascended essentially up the stairs here, um, a, a, a small room that led out to the balcony area with a projection booth above. And then this was all open to the second floor, uh, both in the seating area and in the stage. And then from the second floor to the third floor, very interesting space. Um, the third floor was essentially uh, originally what was called this, uh, the studio for special art exhibitions. Uh, later, the Robert Frost room. And now I believe the trustees meeting room here. Um, but then to the east of it, uh, a series of um, small uh, writing rooms for, for private use here. See, so as, as you make your way up through the building and ever increasingly uh, uh, privacy to it. Um, the interior finishes were and are I exquisite. They, they really are. Um, although the size, in the, uh, the size and use of the rooms vary throughout the library, there is generally kind of a, a um, a unique sort of universal palette of materials used to finish them, them all. Um, and in keeping with the domestic uh, theme of the architecture, the interior finishes were modeled after those typically found in, in formal examples of quote unquote co colonial dwellings. And this is kind of where Cox um, um, uh, moves away from this 18th, uh, century mansion house form and utilizes a more kind of um, uh, almost an austere sort of a fe the federal style uh, form of interior treatments with a lot of the woodwork in here versus that the heavy sort of paneled work you would find in, in one of those uh, mansion houses. Um, so, you know, the, the quality of this woodwork is, is worth noting. And one of the details that I came across as I, as I went through the archival information was, uh, was this essentially a, what's called a schedule of values. So as, as, as the contractor's constructing the building, he submits to the owners a schedule of values and that's what they invoice or pay, pay the contractor against. And it lays out each category of work, you know, concrete and um, maybe uh, painting and um, roofing and all these different items. And for the interior finish woodwork, that line item came in at $42,642. That one single item represented approximately 18% of the overall cost of the building. Um, went into just treating the interior um, finishes. So um, 
that, you know, and these finishes were largely um, Philippine mahogany for things like doors, uh, mantel pieces, trim work, um, uh, a lot of the Finnish uh, mill work in, in the building. Um, the, the stair I just showed you was what was known as a um, Philippine walnut. Um, that, that was sort of its, its common name. It's an it's a, um, imported wood. Um, and then a lot, all the flooring uh, appears to have been oak flooring that was used through, through the building. But um, uh, let's see. Uh, there's a certain sort of re restrained elegance to the treatment of, of the millwork. It's wonderful. It's 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 wonderful design. Um, the interior itself, like I said, it it took on this uh, domestic atmosphere, both in the way the architecture was treated, and then how the spaces were furnished too. Um, you know pieces of furniture that you would expect to find within dwellings, you know, sofas or settees, you know, uh, wing back chairs, um, you know, um, chairs all done again in, in kind of a, this new colonial style, colonial revival uh, style of, of furniture. And uh, here's, you know, the children's reading room, notice sort of the paneled walls here. Um, and sort of, you know, the, the um, pilasters flanking large fireplaces, um, ceiling lighting, really, you know, just beautiful stuff. Very, very well done. So you have this, this cohesive exterior brought into the interior. So this piece of architecture, that's really one unified whole here, you know. Um, so, uh, let's see, where was I? Um, oh, and, you know, again, if, if you look carefully at sort of the details, the, the carved work in the brackets here, you know, again, this is, th this is all inspired, taken from these, these turned newels, what one might expect to see in uh, one of these stately uh, mansion houses uh, in the 18th century. And then elsewhere, this is kind of that more, you know, federal style inspired ornament here with, um, here's a detail of it, you know, gouge and punch work and fluting on the, the pilasters. Um, look at this mantel piece. This is just one of many, but when you look very carefully at it, not only is it sort of this reading and, um, um, you know, fluting underneath, uh, but within it is like this shield motif here and down below. Um, and this goes on and on and on throughout, throughout the rooms. Um, some of the, uh, the, the capitals in, uh, in the woodwork in the, the children's reading room and at the main entry of, of the library uh, utilize uh, detailing in, inspired by that Connecticut River Valley design. You know, it's not, it's not an exact copy of it but it alludes to that tradition that was um, um, seen on the you know, furniture of the 17th and 18th centuries. Um, so so that's, that, that's a look at the 1928 building. Now, um, we were asked to look at the chronology of changes and really, you know, I'm not looking at all the small little details that happen over the decades in order to maintain the building, but these are kind of large campaigns that had some sort of substantial impact on, on the library itself. And the first one that, that occurs is um, this 1968 Alderman and McNeish uh, campaign of improvement. So, so by the 60s, the library is um, running short on space. Um, how the spaces were being utilized have changed and kind of evolved. Like any building, the architects have one intent of, of how buildings are supposed to be funct, you know, function and reality takes over and spaces change and take on kind of their, their own um, use and function. And so by the 60s, uh, it was determined that the building needed more space, um, the sort of the, the room uses and functions needed to be improved. And by this point in time, the auditorium um, was deemed too large for the library's need, needs and essentially called what was a, a waste of space. 
And um, so really what was done at this time was um, on, in the main body of the building, kind of a reorganization of room uses and shifting of, of those. But the greatest impact that occurred was in the auditorium area. Um, and if you haven't seen what the auditorium looked like, looked like originally, these are a couple of good images looking, this is looking at the stage, you're essentially looking to the north. And if you can see behind the stage, there's that Palladian window I showed you from the exterior right here. Um, but, you know, open to the ceiling, vaulted, uh, dormers allowing natural light in. Um, and then if we turn around and look to the rear of the auditorium, we have this gallery up above. Keep an eye on this spindle uh, uh, balustrade that's right here, railing, um, a projection booth above that. And, um, and then seating, another fireplace in the rear. And these are, uh, these have since I believe been closed in, but these would have led out to essentially the entry vestibule at the, in the east wing of, of the building. So this was the space that in the 1960s was converted into more stack space. Um, and here we are in what was the auditorium and if you look very carefully right here are the pile asters to that Palladian window. That's right here. Here's a pile aster and here's a pile aster. So we're on the ground floor here. A second floor was inserted to take advantage of the loftiness of, of the room. And if you look back here, here, here's that railing to the gallery area where the projection booth was, was up here. Um, so that really expanded and provided more, more room in the 1960s. Um, and, uh, but again, 30 years later or so, um, the, the same needs occur, right? Changing, you know, so, so there's a whole mix of factors in, in the late eighties and nineties, right? Um, it's, you know, the need for more room for specialized rooms and uh, spaces, um, for increased community activities to accommodate new and emerging technologies that were out there in, in different mediums of, um, of media, right? Um, records, CDs, things of that nature, DVDs. So um, that's where we have this, the second large campaign that takes place, the 1993 Mark Mitchell Associates edition, which um, I believe adds somewhere in the area of about 12,000 square feet to, to the library. So um, here's the end of the original building, the auditorium space. And um, this addition essentially um, fills in to the, uh, to the west and to the south here, um, utilizing, again, it, it, it was a sympathetic design to, you know, to, to the library, uh, utilizing a similar palettes of materials, um, window fenestration, things of that nature. Um, but it also incorporated the, the atrium to it too, to, you, to take advantage of this cent central court essentially um, that, that was created by the construction of the, uh, the perimeter addition here. So, um, with the construction of, uh, uh, of the 93 edition, um, essentially it was just at, you know, it was largely added on to the existing library. And what this is showing is the floor plan of the 1928 building um, overlaid to the, uh, with the 1993 first floor plan to it. And um, there were some, you know, some alterations made in order to you, uh, you know, open up window openings that were redundant, that were no longer needed, um, widening some doorways in order to allow uh, you know, better access through, through spaces, um, a reconfiguring of, uh, of this, the office spaces here within the, the, the main building, meaning the addition of, of a wall and doorways here and there. But by and large, the 1928 structure um, remains, you know, l largely intact. Um, you know, there were some modifications, but it's still in there 
um, buried within the, the, the greater whole here. Um, in looking at the condition of, of, of the library, um, considering its age, the, the 1928 building appears to remain in, in fairly good condition. Uh, and that's an, a testament to um, its accomplished design, the, the use of quality materials in its construction, um, and just good, good general construction overall. The way this structure, uh, the, 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 the structure itself, you know, what's buried behind these walls is, a, is essentially a very, you know, stout method of building. Um, the problems that were observed largely relate to just the sheer age age of the building and that it's been out in the weather for you know nearly coming up on a hundred years so things like uh the roofing uh the window systems the storm windows paint finishes um they've they've essentially reached their end at the end of their service life and really just you know need uh, need to be addressed. Um, so if we look at, you know, at the slate roof itself, you know, this is a, a hundred year old slate roof. This is um, Buckingham slate, which is from Virginia. Um, originally it was going to be a, a beautiful, well, it was going to be a main slate, Munson main slate. There was a change order. Um, they're both probably two of the best slates that, that you could use. Um, but you know what? What you see here in the New England climate, this is typical of a slate roof of its age. You know, um, you have snow and ice coming off of upper roofs that that come down, crack slates. You have nails that corrode, rust through time, and let slates slip out and disappear. Um, you have repairs, peri periodic repairs made to it. Here's the roof of the West Sun Room. You can see that's taken a beating from the upper roofs, dropping snow and ice down onto it. Um, you've, you know, you got your money out of the, this roof. You definitely did, you know. Um, it served its, um, its term. Uh, the other thing are, you know, are just our paint finishes and paint periodically needs to be, you know, it, it maintained, but over time, if left, you see what we, we have here, you know. Um, and there are other factors uh, at play here that I'll get to in a second. But, um, you know, the, the paint finishes throughout are, are at the end of their service life. Um, other issues that were observed are these periodic changes that have been made to the library through, through time, on, in this case, on the exterior. So, um, you know, here, Clearly, you know, an ADA universally accessible entry needed to be int introduced. Um, so we see here the his historic entry, two steps up in these beautiful. Look at again. This is 1928 material. Cox utilizing that ro rosette motif, the pilaster, uh, the fluted pilasters set on these pedestals. But you know, um, features like this could. Uh, could have been executed better. Could have maintained, you know, the this these door designs. Um, could have maintained, you know, the basis to these pilas, uh, these these uh, columns not just being set into concrete. You know, but but this stuff happens. There are incremental changes that that get done little by little over the course of of, of decades. Um, Probably one of the you know sort of the biggest biggest or largest detractors to to the library though is that it's it's hidden behind all of this this vegetation all of this growth surrounding uh, the library and you know I'm all for landscaping and proper landscaping um, but plantings and trees need to be carefully planned out and located properly because because they mature. That's what, what trees do. Good trees grow. And what seemed to be far enough away, maybe when it was initially planted, turns out to be much too close um, 10, 15, 20 years later. You know, It, it detracts from um, seeing the architecture, really experiencing the building a, as a whole, you know, as what it was meant to be. Um, but it also, you know, with plantings, dense amounts of plantings so close to the building, 
um, traps moisture close and up against a building, something you don't want. You really want buildings to be able to breathe uh, and dry out quickly. So it's, um, you know, it's conditions like these that, that shorten up the lifespan of paint systems that don't let them, you know, um, uh, that traps moisture and causes them to, to fail prematurely. Also, it prevents, you know, natural light from entering into your building. Um, so, you know, it's, it's again, you know, the, it's incremental. These things just creep up slowly over, over years. And then one day you look at it and, you know, <laughs> here, here it is. Um, as we move to the interior of the building, uh, you know, I said, you know, much of the 1928 finishes treatments, you know, survive and are, are there. But again, it's, it's buried behind in incremental changes that I'm sure were, were performed out of necessity. But, um, but when you retrofit existing buildings, um, it's often difficult to integrate these in as, um, as you might in new construction. So what happens is, is first, you know, the fire suppression system shows up and it's run, you know, it's surface mounted here. And going along with that might be emergency lighting and smoke and heat detectors. Um, lighting fixtures periodically change over right through time. So we go from one type to another type to sort of this very modern up lighting here, you know, a, a lighting form that that the, the, the design of the space wasn't really intended for, um, you know, retrofitting the fireplaces with with mechanicals infilling that, you know, so little by little, the space um, takes on th this appearance and is more sort of distant from how it was originally intended to, uh, to appear to, to those using the library, to the public. Um, so this, you know, th this incremental change on the interior, and, and I see this all the time, especially with, with um, sort of, you know, in institutional buildings. It's, it's, you know, over the decades, it's, it's what happens. Um, but perhaps, you know, a change that I think makes a huge difference on how the interior appears to people is that it's lost its color. It's, it's been diluted. And if we look at these historic photos taken shortly after the building was constructed, you see the white of this cornice here that I'm sure was, you know, was painted white and even the ceilings, we see the walls in a, in a darker, a contrasting color itself. Um, and this is seen throughout the historic images of, of the library. So you look at the, the stair hall here, see the darker wall color here. Who knows what that, that color was originally. You look into the uh, adult reading room beyond, you see there's a different tone to the wall surface here. Um, at the completion of the library, uh, the trustees reached out to, to the contractors and different um, subcontractors and asked for quantities that were used in the completion of the building. And in the shop that furnished, uh, did the interior decorating, the painting of the interior, they note that they used uh, over 9,900 pounds of paint pigment in, in uh, finishing the interior of the library and over 200 gallons of what they call liquids, which I'm sure is turpentine and probably linseed oil. They're mixing um, the paints for, you know, for, the, um, for the interior use. So clearly the interior was, was, um, uh, had a much different appearance color-wise than, than we see today. Uh, and then finally, I'd like to finish by, I was, at, you know, as part of this, the scope of the work, we were asked to provide uh, recommendations for the treatment of, of the building. And what I can offer you are, are essentially guidelines for how to treat or, or an approach to treating uh, the library. So as I say here, you know, preservation involves treating existing construction in a manner that respects the original and uh, original design 
and intent of the architecture. Um, this is, you know, this is an approach, a philosophical approach, you know, how you, how you um, decide to, to treat your building here. So um, what I recommend is establishing a framework that, that shapes this approach that preserves and protects those character defining features of the building, both inside and out, so that future repairs and improvements can be planned, implemented, and someday maybe even removed with the least impact uh, to the integrity of the building. It's a sustainable way of managing what, what you have here. You're, you're stewards of this building. Um, and again, you know, if the, if the idea is to manage this for future generations, it needs to be done in a considered way. Um, and I'm not gonna read these ver verbatim, but the idea is that, you know, um, any of the work affecting the 1928 building should, you know, be done in a way that avoids altering or damaging the, the historic fabric. Uh, there needs to be a respect for the original design intent and the features and the elements uh, of it must be considered in any future improvements. Um, you know, use of spaces should be compatible with their original use uh, or, you know, so that any functions are done to minimize change to the layout and volumes of, of the space. Original material materials and character defining elements should be retained as much as possible, maybe even reinstated if they're missing. Um, new programs introduced to the building should be sympathetic to the fabric of the space. Let, let the building tell you what can be done with it. Don't impose your ideas onto it. Um, Materials used in the repair of the building should that meet or exceed the quality of those used in the original construction. Um, the workmanship should match the quality of construction originally um, originally utilized, and um, and probably one of the more difficult, but one of the more important is that the installation or replacement of modern building systems uh, should should not be done in a way that adversely affects the integrity of the building. Um, and, and like I said, past you know, alterations that detract from the integrity of the building should be reversed when circumstances allow. Um, these guidelines, you know, these are kind of you know, developed and tailored to your building. They parallel the Secretary of Interior standards for the treatment of historic buildings um, that are a much more general and broadly stated um, method, you know, sort of uh, uh, treatment or recommendations. Um, so, you know, if, if you're going after, you know, I believe there's CPA money that might be used in this or, or tax credits, things of that nature, um, you'll need to sort of, you know, uh, to abide by th those standards um, in order to, um, uh, to meet, you know, the, the regulations for the, those monies. Um, so that's just a, a quick overview of the historic structures report itself. Uh, if you haven't read it, I please urge you to read it. I think you'll find it interesting. Um, it's only a small amount of a great wealth of archival information that exists within your special collections department. Um, it, it's really a, a fascinating story, a fascinating building to, to look at. And it's really a, a wonderful piece of, of community architecture that was bestowed upon you from um, you know, generations ago. And, and it was a privilege really to look at this building and have an opportunity to sort of get those, to know those who are involved in the design of it and, and what they were thinking. So, so with that, I'll conclude my, uh, my presentation. And uh, Jane or Ben, I'll allow you to to take over from here. Eric, thanks so much for a, a, just an amazing presentation about uh, the importance of this structure. I think really, you know, the, what you described is the inheritance of the Connecticut River Valley, um, the unique Connecticut River Valley um, architecture and um, decorative tradition uh, has 
just really, I think, struck a chord, really um, driven home. Uh, one, one of the kind of really essential features of this library um, and its inheritance from uh, domestic architecture at the same time, at the same time, you know, I think it's just amazingly illuminating to have um, the historical and architectural perspective that that you and your colleagues Anne and Carly you, that you all have brought to uh, to our understanding of this building um, and to the original concept of the library uh, in the beginning. Um, and it's just really amazing to think about what is unique about it and, and of that uniqueness, how much survives. So uh, I, I can honestly say I, I, I can't cite another example of a, of a, you know, an institutional civic building um, similar to this here in the Connecticut River, River Valley. I mean, it's a, it's a really unique piece of architecture. It, you know, it's a continuation of the tradition here in the valley. That's the way I look at it, you know? Yeah, yeah. That, that, that's just really, you know, astonishing, just really wonderful to, to understand so much more about it. Um, so I think from here, I'd like to um, offer Anne and Carly an opportunity to make any comments you'd like to make. Then um, I think we could take about um, I don't know, five, 10 minutes for um, questions from, or comments, questions or comments from um, library trustees and members of the Historical Commission. Uh, and then there can be a similar period of public comment. Um, so Anne and Carly, is there anything you'd like to add at this point? I think, you know, I don't have anything else to add other than how much I appreciate the team and uh, just a pleasure and such a learning experience and, and all of you who help with this, it's a pretty short process, but um, short and intense. So thank, thank you all. And thanks again for the opportunity. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see, Austin or Sharon, are there things that you'd like to comment on at this point? Absolutely. So, uh, first of all, I, I'm incredibly grateful. Um, I've been in that building, I, I don't know, dozens, dozens of times. I've led tours of the building. Um, I've gotten lost and wandered for hours trying to figure out which stairway to take. Uh, I've searched in vain for a usable restroom. Uh, and I thought I knew the building. But seeing it through your eyes, uh, I realized there's so much in that building that I had never seen and never, um, and never appreciated. So uh, for that and uh, for the consolation of the next time I'm lost in the building, <laughs> I will have a greater appreciation of um, of the building in which I'm lost. I'm incredibly, I'm incredibly grateful. I'm going to say back to you uh, what I've heard you say. This building is a treasure, and the 1928 building, despite. Uh, somewhere here and there, and I loved your thing about the absence of color, the 1928 building has been well curated and well cared for. And that's a remarkable tribute to uh, directors of the library, boards of the trustees of the library, and the staff of the library for generations. So it's a gift to all of us that this building has been handed down from generation to generation, uh, cared for in the way it has been, uh, so that you can say in 2021, this building is in really good condition. 
The other thing I wanted to say that I, which I heard, that I heard you say, and by the way, I appreciate the recommendations. Uh, the Jones Library went through an extensive vetting of architects. Uh, when we contemplated years ago, the renovation in addition to the building. One of the standards that guided our choice was we wanted a firm with a record of historical preservation uh, that uh, we could be certain, of which we could be certain. And we looked carefully and we finally chose Feingold Alexander. In that firm, we thought then, and hearing your presentation, I think yet again, of what a wise choice that is. Because you've offered us a vision, not just about, and I loved your recommendation about a set of standards that the trustees should adopt. Your recommendations really gave me confidence that we have the right um, architects who will, I loved what you said, who will, uh, this was kind, it was, that was kind of architect talk, uh, who will listen to the building. I love the idea where architects talk about how buildings speak to you. Uh, so for the, the wonderful way of re-seeing the library that you've offered us, for the gratitude that you've inspired to generations of trustees and library directors that have cared for this building and for the confidence that you've given me in our choice of architects to work on this gem of a building. Um, I'm very grateful. Thank you very much. That, that Your words mean quite a bit. They do. It's, you know, when you say you get lost in a building, the, the, the best way to experience buildings are to get lost in buildings and you know, <laughs> find, and find your way through. I, I went to school in a large country house in England uh, for a period of time. And the best way to, to sort of get to know that building was just to wander it and find the spaces you would not find otherwise by just coming across them. And, and the library is very similar to that because you know it, it gets its character from being inspired by a large residence. If it was this quote unquote, let's say, you know, a classical inspired building, there would be this rigid symmet you know, symmetry imposed upon its plan and its elevation. And it would be almost, you know, just a natu naturally understood. But, um, but these little spaces up on the third yeah. floor, you know, these, um, these rooms up above the wings of the building, you know, are, are very intimate right. and very inviting, you know, and, um, and really, the, I mean, it, it, it's a very unique building. It's a very personal building. I'm sure when Alan Cox designed it, um, that was on, you know, on his mind. And like, again, I'll say it again, there's no other building quite like it yeah. in this immediate region. Yeah. Absolutely. Sorry, uh, I'm going to, let's see, I saw, oh, Sharon, and then I think maybe Catherine had uh, something she'd like to say. So Sharon first, then Catherine. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, just, so just quickly, Eric, that was awesome. Um, I had a blast meeting with you guys and, you know, I didn't get to spend a lot of time with you. Cindy and George did all the heavy lifting. And, and then you, of course, but this presentation, so here I was expecting like a 10 minute, and what you just gave us was amazing. So thank you so thank much. You. And your, your passion absolutely shines through. And that's fabulous. I could sit here another hour and listen to you. <laughs> and so when I give tours in the future, I will be able to use um, many of your nuggets of information in those tours. So thank you again. Um, I want to kind of piggyback on what Austin was saying. I, you know, I have to remember that here I am in a historic commission meeting, a joint meeting, which is very different from my focus, which is 
running a 20, trying to run a 21st century public library, the 22nd busiest public library in the state of Massachusetts. So we've come a long way from this sweet, beautiful, um, you know, building, small town library building that was built in 1928, where, you know, the residents used it to now a, a, a building that serves so many people from up and down the valley and across the state. And so finding that happy medium with our incredible architects, Feingold Alexander, you know, between, uh, I'm sorry, Eric, I love you, but getting lost in the public library is not great for patrons. <laughs> we don't want that. Um, and so, you know, and having those small rooms, again, it's not, it's not helpful for a 21st century public library, but having the information that you've just presented us will allow us to make those informed decisions and, and end up with a better result. So thank you again. You're, you're welcome. Yeah. You know, one thing I, I failed to mention, I really should have, you know, when, when the library was first opening, and I'm sure you know this, right? It, it, to call it a library is not doing it justice. It's, um, it really is a community building, you know? It was, um, you know, when it was first opened, it, it housed uh, collections from the historical society in it, right? There were community activities that took place in, in the basement and, and elsewhere. And, and that's just continued, you know, through time and, uh, and probably more so now than ever. So, you know, by calling it a, a library, it's, it's much more than that, it, 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 you know. And um, uh, where was I going with my, my thoughts on this one? It's, you know, oh, um, uh, you know, uh, as it relates to, you know, dealing with a 1927 building in 2022, um, and I don't know if you've done this already or, or not, but, you know, all I say is, is, you're not the only communities that are dealing with, you know, deal with a, uh, an iconic historic building that need to build it out and expand. And I, you know, I just, I throw out the names like H.H. H. Richardson, you know, and the Ames Library out in Northeastern. And, and, um, and well, another Richardson building was in, in uh, uh, Quincy in Woburn, you know, um, these, these are magnificent pieces of architecture they're not museums, they need to grow and be dynamic and be interesting. And so other people have wrestled with these ideas and the, you know, and um, all I say to you is, is, is take the best of those ideas and, and run with them and find out what doesn't work and, and you know, and avoid those, so. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm gonna actually take advantage of my, uh... <laughs> my position as moderator here to <laughs> just throw in a little historical tidbit, which is that um, when the current town hall was built in the 1880s, after a fire that destroyed the, the previous building on Palmer Block, uh, one of the features of the new building, the new town hall was a performance space, an auditorium and performance space in that building, which apparently was not adequate 40 years later, because the Jones Library then incorporated a new uh, auditorium and stage and performance space. So communities, communities have a way of changing. Yeah. Um, so um, Catherine, I think you had your, you, you were. Um, I did, something. yes. Thank you, Jane. Um, I have actually, my comments a little delayed. Uh, first, I'll just say thank you so much for the wonderful presentation, but I actually raised my hand at the time because I noticed that Carly had raised her hand to speak, but I don't think she was noticed, so I wanted to make sure that oh, we gave you. her the time to go back and be able to have a comment. Okay, thank you. I'm so sorry, Carly, I didn't see your hand. So, Carly, welcome. Um, Carly has been uh, an, an integral and important member of the team working on this historic structure report. So please, Carly. Oh, it's just really quick. I just wanted to thank you all for letting me take part in this. I learned a lot, so thank you for everything. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, then um, 
let's see, we have just a few minutes left. If there are any questions or comments by members of the Historical Commission, um, this is a good opportunity to, to raise your hand. And any other comments or questions by uh, uh, library trustees before we open a little period of public comment? All right then, okay. So now I'm gonna just open a brief period of public comment. If any um, members of the audience in attendance um, have comments, then we'll have a, uh, you can have, you know, a, up to two minutes to make a comment. Um, please be concise. And if your comment um, invites a response, then I'll invite the responders to be similarly concise. Okay, so I see Sarah McKee has a hand raised. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, great, thank you. Um, thank you for this marvelous presentation. Um, I too thought that I knew the library building and I see more in it that eluded me for years. I would like to give credit to the historical preservation architect in the 1993 um, project, Alan Heil, who was specifically retained in order, as I understand, in order to make sure that the woodwork um, was properly taken care of. So I think I heard in some of your comments, um, commendation of some of his work. Um, I have a concern in that the, the, the Amity Street facade, now I see more in it than I ever saw before. And there is, the trustees have a 1990, 19, 2017, sorry, lost a decade, um, historic preservation agreement for the Amity Street facade uh, based on uh, $140,000 in CPA funds for um, preservation of the chimneys and all, and it appears to me that um, there might have to be some modifications to the uh, demolition and uh, ex expansion plans in order to comply with that uh, 2017 historic preservation agreement. So I would, I would ask whether the trustees, this is not for a question now, but ask whether the trustees are looking at that. Thank you. Um, I, this, the purpose of this meeting is to hear and receive and learn about the historic structure report. So uh, I'm not, uh, I don't, I appreciate the question and I think it can be answered in another venue. I would agree, thank you. Thank you, okay. Um, all right, are there other, um, other members of the public who would like to make a comment on the presentation we've seen tonight. Then um, I'm just going to um, express as enthusiastic appreciation for the work of Anne Marshall, Eric Godoya and Carly Regalado uh, for um, just a, a, a really fabulous contribution to our understanding of our town's architectural history and cultural history. Um, this is, uh, this is a, uh, some work that is going to live on as a way for us to understand what, the, what this library has meant these hundred years. I mean, you know, I think back to the origin of the library that um, Samuel Jones had no heirs, um, had a fortune, and wanted to use it for the benefit of the town. And um, that's a just an extraordinary legacy that, that he left and one that um, I don't know if he could have imagined 
the impact of that uh, of that legacy. So uh, it's a tremendous comment on uh, on the the community of Amherst as it has existed in the past and in the present and will be in the future. Um, so I believe, um, Austin, there may be some comments you'd like to make and also- Jane, I just wanted to, before to we end um, and before I get my warm milk and cookies, mm -hmm. I, I wanted to thank you especially for the foresight, uh, the genius, uh, to suggest that we go through this exercise. I have to say, at the beginning, I thought, Jane Wald, what kind of idea is that? And I now think, Jane Wald, that was a great idea. So thank you very, very much. <laughs> thank you, Austin. <laughs> I'm just going to giggle about that all night. <laughs> All right, um, um, Austin. Do you need? Do you need to? We need to adjourn. We need trustee? to adjourn. So, yeah. is there a, a library trustees a motion to adjourn? So moved. Thank you, Tammy. Is there a second? Second. So, I think I need to ask for a, a vocal vo vote on the motion to adjourn. Bob Pam. Yes. Uh, Alex. Yes. Farah. Yes. Tammy. Yes. Lee Edwards. Austin Sarrett votes and cast Lee Edwards proxy. So the library, <laughs> library board of trustees is adjourned. Okay, thank you all so much. It's been, it's been a real uh, pleasure to and delight to uh, spend this time this evening with you and to learn so much more about the, the history of the Jones Library. Once again, um, thanks to Anne and Eric and Carly, and um, in particular, Cindy Harbison, uh, who has been such a tremendous resource for, for this project. So thank you all. Uh, the Historical Commission will continue its meeting uh, and those who wish to stay may stay. <laughs> those, those who have had enough of this can Thank you very much. Return Jane. to your evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks all. Um, okay, so uh, we have left on our agenda uh, the preservation plan RFP, November seventeenth and October twentieth meeting uh, minutes, and it is nine oh six. Please tell me what your pleasure is for the remainder of this evening. <laughs> Approved. Have you had supper? Good. I I I I'm I move that we do our minutes from the last meeting and then adjourn. Here, here. Or I have a question. Do we do we have a need for another short? meeting to go over the plan or just put it off for next month? Ben, what would you like to do? There, it, because it is an RFP, there may be some time sensitivity about it. Do you, do you have a sense of? Um... Oh, no, I mean, I, I haven't released the RFP. It, it's, uh, it's, this is just to kind of develop the draft and, and uh, language. So there's not really a time constraint other than Okay, good. It's time time to update the preservation plan, but if it takes another month or two, that's that's totally fine. You I think I send us wording to look over. I it's in the packet, but oh okay, it is okay. in the one that's yeah. online. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How did I miss that? Yeah. So Ben, I've got I'm I'm going to send you uh, kind of a I don't know sort of track changes thing that might have some questions and okay. comments and edits and and I'll do that so you've got it well okay. before our next meeting. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I That's have. Totally I have fine. I'm sorry. I have one other question. Um, how because I think this is time sensitive for the developer. How do we go ahead? with making sure that report is filed 
you know, in a pretty timely manner because it, it matters to him um, financially as well. Uh, so what do we do? I, I, I'm new, yeah. so I don't know what yeah. the process is. So, yeah, I, I too have a few questions about that. And one is, um, so maybe we can just kind of assemble our questions first and then and, and discuss. So one question is, um, does, can we submit to the MACRIS database uh, a form B for a structure that's gonna be demolished? We can't, okay. Yeah. <laughs> right. I, I, think that, I think there's, there's, uh, there's submissions that are made even after. Uh, okay. Being that, that's reassuring. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Then, um, so what are the kind of what are the they're kind of the basics of a form B. So that's I, I think we just need to decide who's who who is going to pull that information together. Um, yeah, here's here's the uh, template that they have. Oh, good. So you know, photograph, locus map. You know, some basic information. And then down here, it's you know architectural description and narrative, and you know I've I've seen as little as like just one sentence scribbled like by hand. Like a lot of the inventory forms in Amherst were done in 1977, so they're done by hand. But then some of the ones done more recently by PVPC, you know, have a you know solid block of you know maybe seven to ten sentences explaining the. Uh, description and narrative so okay so ben is um you know of course an obvious question is how much of this are you able to do and at what point do we need to shift it to either uh, pvpc or members of the commission um can you can you give us a sense of what your I, capacity I is? I imagine I should be able to do this pretty quickly. Um, if okay. there's there's other there's people that are better versed in architectural lingo than than I am. If if someone else wanted to take a stab at the uh, you know describing the features, I would definitely invite that. Um, I can take a take a stab at it, but. Um, Okay, that would be great. So maybe we, um, okay, so then there's the, the piece about um, the context and the, the, the uh, kind of the historical significance of this type of architecture. So is that something that would best be handled by at least make some member of the commission making a a, a beginning at that, making a stab at that. I mean, someone. I mean, if one among us has, <laughs> and I'm, I guess I'm thinking maybe Jan or Hetty or Catherine <laughs> has some kind of understanding of how to figure this out, <laughs> uh, either to give us some guidance on it or to uh, just kind of dig into it, scratch the surface a bit on it. Is that something that is uh, would be useful to you, Ben? Um, yeah, I mean, certainly it would be helpful to have maybe like a point person just to bounce some ideas off of. Um... Um, ben, I'd be happy to do that in conjunction with you working on it and just talking to me and, and my suggesting wording and stuff. I'm just, I'm deep okay. in writing lectures for this semester, so I'm feeling really overwhelmed. Yeah, yeah. Of um, but, I, um, but I'd be happy to particularly help with the context. Um, I went online while we were talking and found all sorts of examples of buildings like that. Um, yes. From that period. So um, obviously we're not going to attach those photos, but we can describe the general form based upon looking at more than just that one. Mm -hmm. um, and they're from the late 60s through the early 70s, you know. So um, even the materials would be part of describing the building. The, the kind of disparaging remarks that Kyle was making are actually 
the elements that make up these this <laughs> particular type. You know. Yeah, uh, exactly. It was it was a way of saving money and simplifying, you know, form. So anyway, I'd be happy to work with you, but if you get started and then maybe we can do it by phone so it's not so much sitting at the computer, because I just yeah. I spend 12 hours a day at it and it's killing me. Yeah. Okay. Um, is there any uh, so I hope kind of hate to hate to ask directly, but is there any backup that maybe Catherine or Hetty? Yeah, I, I, that, I was actually going to say something, Jane. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you, Hetty. Okay. I, I, I am in a similar boat as, you know, Jan rather is that I am so overwhelmed and like, right. I'm also on zoom like okay. nine, 10 hours a day. So I am a certainly able to be a backup or work in conjunction as a team. And that might be the best way that I can offer help. I'm just, I want to be cautious of the fact that I don't overbook myself so, so early in the year and then not be able to follow through on it. So that's, that's just my consideration. I don't want to let anyone down. Okay. Jane, I'm, I'm happy to help. Um, I, I, I have some time between now and the beginning of term. Okay. Oh, fantastic. Thanks, Eddie. Well, I'm beginning. So <laughs> if you have some time. I, I stopped I teaching architectural history. So, okay. Yeah. Well, I, I guess my, I mean, this is like way outside my, my uh, area. But um, well, I guess my only little tiny bit of advice is don't go too far down the rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Short and sweet, less is more. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. it's yeah. great. Yeah. I just want to make our case a little bit about uh, the fact that it is valuable. I think right. we're just starting to come into the state probably from this era. Mm -hmm. and we need to justify why we're doing it and sort of set a precedent, it seems, yeah. right? Okay, that sounds great. Thank you all so much for yeah, that. Thank you. Uh, I think, you know, this, this team, this is a great team. And, you know, you can lighten the load for each other, but also come out with a, a terrific product. Oh, and... <laughs> Make sure that you make Kyle do some work for this. Yeah, uh, he's gonna do all the photographs, right? He was willing to fill out the form it, it, during the meeting and then it kind of got taken away from him. So <laughs> it's just yeah. as well we do it. Yeah. Okay, um, great. Thank you all so much for that. Um, I think it's a, uh, it kind of sets an important precedent in a way, you know, to, to, uh, mm -hmm. to, to uh, to convey the seriousness with which we consider uh, structures that are really just 50 years old mm -hmm. um, so that we don't lose their significance when they become 80 years old or 100 years yeah. old. Well, and that's why I was being such a pill in the meeting because I knew we were going to end up saying they could demolish it, but I wanted to make sure there was a process we went through. Yeah. For yeah. us, for the town, and for Archipelago, that it's not that easy. These these aren't just, you know. I mean, they yeah. just want it knowing they're going to take it down, and I want them to think a little more and know that we're thinking. Yes, agreed. And doing the form B and filing it will will, will certainly um, document the mm -hmm. existence of the building and it, it, in its context as well. Mm -hmm. So, thank you. On the, on the team here who are going to do that. And yeah. remember that we have to remember when we go into these hearings that voting that something is historically significant does not mean we're necessarily granting immediate permission for demolition. Um, it also doesn't mean that we're immediately denying it. It's right. just part of the process. And sometimes we can take a stand by saying, yes, it's significant and still grant the demolition and we tend to forget that we're shy of saying any of those criteria stick you know but mm -hmm. if they do they do yeah you know i think i made an error when i asked for a motion without suggesting that uh the motion could be to continue the hearing and 
you know, I know we had talked about that previously and it just kind of evaporated for me in the moment. So, um, so. We you. didn't really need to spend more time, I think, because mm -hmm. I think we came up with a good solution. You know, it just would have been yet again, and Kyle would have probably had a heart attack, but, um, which is fine, he's getting paid for it, but, um, <laughs> oops, this is being recorded. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, I mean, we could have dragged it out, but really we, we went over what the issues were and ultimately we made our point. And now we're, we're going to get something from it. The building was going to come down either way. Even if we put a delay in a year, it would have come down. Yeah. So, you know. Yeah. You know, I think what's one thing that's important to the documentation of this is the original plan for the suite of buildings in that location. That's yeah. a good, good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hedy, yeah. is that something you think UMass would have? Yeah, I'm, I was just thinking that. I think if we, you know, I'll probably give the people in special collections a call. That I haven't dealt great. with them at UMass, but I used to deal with them at UNH a lot because I was teaching using those kinds of mm -hmm. resources. And, um, you know, I, I think I'll just make some phone calls and maybe go to the library directly. But I, I also am very taken by what Jane just said about not going too far down the rabbit hole, but a, 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 a good a good form B with a proper set of photographs. You know, we've done we've done what we can. Um, I, I'm sure some kind of document exists with the, the whole kind of um, village of Greek life. You know, um, it wasn't the only location. There was another one on uh, on um, Pleasant Street as well, and then a number of buildings burnt down. I mean, it's it's a it's a sort of it's its own history. And um, well, if we just had like a street plan showing where the plots were for this, yeah. and then maybe a photograph of the first few buildings that went up to show this wasn't the only one that looked like that. Right. Maybe. I yeah. mean, there are three. That's good point. Yeah. 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 I think we. I think it's really important that we see if we can find pictures of the building that archipelago already yeah. demolished <laughs> um you know because there were three there are three um the out one of that still doesn't look original anymore they've done things to it so it'd be nice if we had the other one probably was still original because it hadn't been modified by the university i assume yeah i've i've asked about the architect um you know the the the, the colonial revival -y building when I was at Kappa Kappa Gamma on Nutting Avenue um, had a, a named architect and they frequently would use their national affiliates to, to kind of provide architectural services. So it's very possible that there's some kind of national um, headquarters architect or company that would have that could have provided um, the designs, uh, you know, it's it's a very it's a very purposeful building in a very sweet location, and I was really shocked that he had really no documentation for it being in poor condition. Um, I think it's just that it's irrelevant you know, to them. It's yeah, not no, I know, I know. Yeah, I know. But you know, in terms of housing and single people in Am Amherst, you know, you could, you could very easily, devil's advocate, you could very easily make a case for saying, oh, let's take a look at this. And maybe there are some modifications we can make that would house 80 people, you know. Um, Affordably. Know. Right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, it's, it's neither here nor there to a certain, ex to a certain extent, but I'm very happy to do my Get, throw my two cents worth into some actual research. <laughs> Great. Oh. If you could do that point of it, that would be awesome. Uh, yeah, that's that's yeah. fantastic, Hetty. Thanks so much. Well, uh, shall we take up our minutes? I move we accept them. They looked fine to me. Yeah. The, so, Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> I vote yes. That's not a that's not a question. That's that's already a vote. <laughs> that's me like imaginary like scooping food into my mouth. So <laughs> okay. and so there a second? There 
That was the best one. Okay, super. Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 And Hetty, you're an aye also? Yes, aye. aye. Okay. All right. <laughs> Unanimous. Um, minutes accepted. Um, let's see. I see that there are at least a couple of a couple of attendees other than panelists still with us. So we'll, we'll, we will offer public comment and then we, will, we can confirm our next meeting date and adjourn. Are, are, are there any members of the public who wish to make a public comment? Seeing none, um, Shall we uh, confirm a next meeting date? Sure. Yeah, it might be helpful to do uh, maybe the next two dates just to have those on the calendar. Okay. Uh, all right. Did did we already we already had a February date? I think right. I don't see one. No. Okay. I have February February 9th in May. Oh, never mind. That's just a recurring thing. Um, yeah, we didn't. I don't think we picked one. Yeah. Uh, let's see. This is the so the the ninth or the sixteenth would be the next logical date. Um, I'm. I think I'm fine with either one. Yeah, your work. We don't go too late. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm fine with either one. Me too. Yeah. So. Why don't we say the ninth, and I think that'll sort of keep keep our general sequence. And then um, uh, let's see. It was going to be, I think, the third Wednesday. Was that something that worked for you, Pat? Yes. Okay, third Wednesday. So that is uh, the twenty one two. Oh, that's the 16th. The 16th. Right. So, so we're not doing the 9th, we're doing the 16th? Uh, 9th of February. Okay, the second Wednesday. Uh, good point. Y'all right. want to do the third Wednesday? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Sounds, sounds good to me. All right. Okay. Uh, third Wednesday of February is the 16th. Okay. The and third Wednesday, of March, the third the Wednesday of March. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. February 16th, March 16th. Okay. We'll and start meeting on the 16th every time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I um, you know, just make a brief, brief little announcement too is uh, the um, planning board. I know I, I keep on saying this, but I think the planning board might consider taking up the demolition delay bylaw. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> in, in, in we'll February, when it happens. <laughs> I know, I'm, I'm hopeful this time where we have a new new town council with the new, new zoning priorities and demolition delay is definitely a top, top priority this time around. All right. So we got to jump on it before all the other priorities uh, <laughs> take over, but um, I feel like there's definitely internal to town staff, you know, Chris, Nate, and I all feel like it's, it's, it's packaged up, ready to go, and we just need to right. get what it. What nights yeah. do they meet? Um, they also meet on Wednesday nights, and I think uh, Chris had mentioned possibly February 2nd could be um, a date where they look at some bylaw okay. language. All right. Hey, Ben, how often do they meet? Is it once uh, once a month, once every couple of weeks? Um, I think they sometimes meet like every two to three weeks, yeah. Okay, yeah. all right. Okay, just good, good to have in mind. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, thank you all for uh, an action-packed meeting. Yeah, that was exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Eric's great, isn't he? I took a yeah. course last year and it's so entertaining. He has so much information. I know. I yeah. kind of want to take that class. <laughs> yeah. I've yeah, been working with did. Eric since 2004. Oh, wow. uh, and have, yeah, I've worked with him pretty steadily since then. 
at the Emily Dickinson Museum, and he's just, he is fantastic. Yeah, if the vernacular early American architecture course comes up again, any of you who have a chance should take it. It's, yeah. I think it's like four lectures at two hours a shot. It's not bad. You know, it's not like a whole semester. It's really worth it. You see Amherst differently. I do. Yeah. Yeah, it, it was excellent, Jan. Absolutely excellent. Yeah. Well, um, someone, I don't know who, but someone needs to make a motion to adjourn. I, I, I vote that we adjourn. Thank you, Hen. Is there a second? He seconded. Second. Thank Yay. you. <laughs> Every, everybody seconds it. Uh, not debatable. I. <laughs> All Thank you, care. everybody. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay. Take care. All right. Take care, everyone. Good night. Good night, Happy New Year. Happy New Happy Year. New yes. Year.